told you, second best episode of the four. I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to even say maybe the best episode because I'm still on a high having just rewatched it with all of you during the live watch along this morning. And oh boy, was that fun. Well, it was so fun to watch it with a group. But I still think it's the second best of the four. That first episode was pretty spectacular. But I'm curious, how would you rank the episodes so far? Uh, so for me, it would be uh, one, four, two, and then three. But this one really shakes things up. And speaking of the number four, it has four very big twists. And maybe, just maybe, kind of, a very loose Kang connection. At the very least, it opens a door, uh, or points out a door, I think, to possible Moon Knight stories in the larger MCU context down the line. In addition to MCU horror, you know, a corner of the Marvel Universe that they're also uh, building out. But there are some cool uh, ancient Egyptian stories that the, I think this episode reminds you that they could tell as well. All right, so let's discuss. In or I'm going to rank the, uh, the big twists in order of OMG-ness. Now, obviously, the biggest twist of all is this reveal that he's in a mental institution. Or is he? Uh, it's straight out of the Jeff Lemire comics. Uh, some of you have read them. Some of you have been reluctant to read the comics because, you know, I, have to, I, have, I can understand where you're coming from. The Moon Knight comics, every writer has had a very different take on the character. Uh, I guess which is fitting for Moon Knight considering Moon Knight's multiple personalities. But clearly the Jeff Lemire run is extremely influential here. So if you've read the Jeff Lemire run, when you saw this twist, I had read the comic before I saw the screener. So when I saw the twist, I put a smile on my face. I was like, ah, they did it, they did it. But if you didn't read the comics, you probably were like, forget OMG, you were like WTF. Uh, for my, my first reaction, in addition to the smile on my face, they did that twist from the comics, was I was a little frustrated because I was like, how can you resolve a twist like this so late in the six episodes? I really feel that considering how weak episode three was, that they could have, could have condensed the first three episodes into just two, and this really should have been episode three, with three more episodes to go to wrap this all up. Although, let's see, you know, prove me wrong, Marvel MCU and Moon Knight creative team. Let's see how the last two episodes go, uh, you know, how they turn out. And again, the press has not seen the final two episodes, so we're all going to be surprised next week. Uh, I think that this was, this was the shot in the arm that this show needed. I think that interest has waned a bit. Uh, I know some of you will be frustrated with that comment, but you have to have noticed that people, if, if they are still watching Moon Knight, they're not really watching it when it drops. I mean, there's always the diehards who will watch it when it drops, but I've seen a number of you, uh, if you're still watching, you will not, not only not watch it when it drops, but you sometimes don't watch it the day that it drops. And I know some of you are about an episode or two behind. So if you just caught up, welcome to the party. But this, this is gonna be a situation now where people do watch for the final two episodes when the show drops. That's what, uh, a Dis that's what any Disney Plus show, forget Marvel, Marvel and Star Wars. That's what you need to be competitive in the ultra competitive streaming space these days. And I'm glad Moon Knight's finally there. We're gonna have a party with these last two episodes. All right, so what happens? Well, after Mark is shot twice in the heart, once for each personality, but remember, we all know that he has a third secret personality that we've only seen hints of. So maybe that's one of the reasons he doesn't die. Like Catwoman, who needed to be killed nine times in Batman Returns, Moon Knight needs to be killed three times. I have, speaking of three, there are three reasons, I believe, or three ways that he could be brought back. That's one. Maybe it'll be a combination of them. But the other one is that Khonshu could bring him back yet again. He's done it before. Maybe he can do it again. Uh, because remember, when, you know, Layla's father was killed, Mark was also killed, left for dead, and Conchu is the one who brought him back to life, you know, to work for him. There was uh, quite, the, uh, quite, the, the, quite the string attached to that one. But Conchu right now, of course, is trapped in that statue. So maybe Layla could free him, right, to save Mark slash Steven? But would that mean she forgives Mark slash Steven? Or just Mark, I guess, basically? Uh, I mean, she probably certainly understands how things can go sideways when you're tomb raiding, because she just saw Mark slash Steven blown away in front of her. Uh, or maybe she has to make a deal with Conchu. We all know that, you know, he wants her to be his avatar, but I think to have a female Moon Knight already, I don't know how that's gonna go down with some fans because you already have a female Thor, you're gonna have a female Black Panther. 
I don't know if people would riot or not. And you know, Layla, she's a very cool character. She's really coming into her own. Uh, and she's not from the comics, by the way. So her, she, you know, Marvel has a lot of leeway with her. Um, Maybe she, maybe Conchu will give her like she could be like Moon Knight side. I don't know. I don't think there are a lot of good ways that could go. But you know, they've really they've made very big hints that Conchu is interested in Layla as an avatar. So don't be surprised if they do something with that. All right, there's one other way that he could be brought back, and we'll talk about it when we get to it. I wanted to dawn on you, uh, just like it did on me while I was doing this breakdown. All right, so. I don't believe this mental institution is real, even though it's awfully convincing. And they go through great pains to very quickly make you feel like this is what's been going on all along. Just like I think they're trying, that's what they don't, they're trying to convince, they convince you, but they're also trying to convince Mark that this is, this is reality. It's not real in the comics, the mental institution, which is one of the reasons I feel this isn't real. Uh, and also I think the many zany reveals at the end of this very episode reveal that it's not real. Speaking of the comics, I've been seeing in your comments, uh, both on my videos and online on, on social media, that one of the things that Moon Knight fans have liked so much about the comic is that you're never quite sure what's real with Mark and what's his mind playing tricks on him. Maybe none of it's real. Maybe he just created Conchu to give him motivation to be, or the excuse to be a vigilante. I think Kevin Feige likes things a little, you know, he likes to keep it simple as we all know. Although Moon Knight, of course, is anything but a simple character. But I think we can see so far that Kevin Feige has streamlined the character as much as possible. But for those of you, for those Moon Knight fans who have felt that this is too far, you know, speaking of, um, you know, comics continuity, I know there's a contingent of Moon Knight fans who feel this is not loyal to the comic. So now that this element has been introduced, does that assuage you? Does it make you feel a little bit better about this show? I'm very curious about that. Although I'm, I'm sure you probably want to see how this is resolved. All right, so an, uh, 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 a treasure trove of Easter eggs in the last couple of minutes of this uh, episode in a, in a series that has had very few Easter eggs. So let's, let's roll around in them. It's going to be great. So they start off with this clip from the movie Tomb Buster. Uh, Indiana Jones meets uh, uh, um, Tomb Raider in so many serials, right? And of course, the star of this is Dr. Stephen Grant with the crazy British accent, which gives you the idea that that's where uh, one of Mark's personalities has come from. I thought that was very clever. Uh, and, you know, when I first saw it in the screener, it was so jarring. I was like... It felt almost like I'd switched over to a different show, which is kind of, I guess, the point. So I, thought, I think that was very clever. Uh, we'll talk about the VHS gag. Yeah, well, I want to gag in a moment. I want to do these in order. Then you see Crawley. Crawley was so crucial in the comic book storyline. I wonder if Crawley will suddenly become more important here or if he's just an Easter egg for comic book fans. Uh, the police serving as orderlies that's super important in the comics and i wonder if they'll go as far as the comic books the comic book did i would hope so uh you see donna from the museum holding a scarab stuffy right scarab stuffy they're serving cupcakes straight out of episode one uh that woman's doing a drawing of conchu there's a goldfish there right layla's there with a marshmallow one of the marshmallows she ate in episode the beginning of episode three remember and then this is very important. When she's put, pinning that picture to the board, it drops down. And it seems to be a picture of the very mental institution that they're in, one of the hallways. So I thought that that's, I think, I think that's probably very telling, right? Like they've, you know, and it turns upside down almost. And upside down, uh, you know, is a big theme in this show uh, visually. We've seen that shot looking at things so up, upside down so many times. Even the beginning of this episode featured, uh, some, you know, upside down. So I think that's crucial. Uh, then when she comes closer to him, you can see that she has a Band-Aid on her finger and that drawing is of a scarab, right? So lots of scarab uh, imagery. He's chained to the wheelchair, just like he chained himself to his bed. He's holding a Moon Knight action figure. Uh, and then Harrow is his psychiatrist, once again doing his best Harrison Ford impression. Uh, now in the comic, his psychiatrist was Ahmet herself, or, a, a, or you know, an extension of Ahmet. So I think... That's an interesting, uh, you know, a little bit of a change. 
Um, but I liked the joke about uh, Harrow saying, it was nice to see my VHS player still worked watching this movie. Uh, and he mentions that a lunar god is a big part of the Tomb Buster storyline. And of course, Khonshu is the Egyptian lunar god. So I thought that was great. And so he's talking about this in terms of trying to help Mark with his mental health. But we see so many clues or Easter eggs in this room as well. The picture on the wall is this village from episode one. He has a cane here as well, and he's wearing the same sandals. Uh, there are Egyptian artifacts, faux or real, scattered across the room. And Harrow also says something very interesting about perspective and context and how they shape reality. Talking about a pen and how to a human, to Harrow, it's a writing tool, but to his dog, it's a chew toy, and both things are true. I thought that was very well written, and we'll see if that comes into play uh, with the rest of the episodes. Or it's just an interesting commentary on, you know, psychiatry. But I thought it was a good line. Uh, then, but Mark's like, you shot me. And he, he stumbles out of the room, and Harrow's like, don't hurt him to his orderlies. Uh, that was great. Ethan Hawke's doing a very good job here. I still think it should have been an Egyptian actor, but I can't deny that Hawke's fantastic. So in the hallway, things already start to unravel. The fixtures on the ceiling don't fit the rest of the decor, and they seem more like light fixtures in a tomb, right? So is he still in that tomb? I have a theory. All right. He finds Stephen hidden in a sarcophagus, and I thought it was adorable when they hugged. They've been fighting this whole season, but now that the chips are down and Mark feels so alone, he's just so happy to see himself. And of course, you know, Stephen confirming their last memory that Harrow shot them. Uh, so that was great. I mean, and by the way, this totally takes away from The Flash, which is also about mental illness and has multiple Ezra Millers working together. So that movie's just so delayed at this point, it's going to have nothing fresh left by the time it hits theaters. Uh, but uh, this is interesting. So far, we've only been outside of Mark slash, slash Stevens' body. But in the comics, the personalities often talk to each other within the body. So it's a little bit like Herman's Head or the new season of Flight Attendant, which I think is very, very interesting. And we could see all three personalities having discussions if this show, you know, maybe within the show so far or if it continues for a second season. Did they call this one a limited series? I know Obi-Wan is a limited series. I, I mean, with this twist so late in the game, I'm like, you can't, I would be, a, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they can only make so many Marvel Plus shows, but let's see how it ends. But I think they're making a good case for a second season. Now, as they're trying to escape, there's another sarcophagus, which is red, which is a danger color, uh, particularly in film. Uh, and someone's, something's trying to get out. That's the third personality. That's Jake Lockley, I bet, uh, who they've, again, been hinting at in the show so far. Then they find a hippo Egyptian god, and that, you know, that's the big end. And that is Taoret. Some of you during the live watch along really knew your Egyptian gods. I was impressed. But I looked Taoret up, and she is the goddess of fertility and childbirth, but also rebirth. That's right, rebirth. Another way to bring them back. She could help them uh, and, and, and resurrect Mark slash Stephen slash Jake. Very interesting. Now, are they in the Wall of the Gods, right? Has, has uh, Mark Steven somehow gotten into that? Because I believe it's hard to see who, who is there with Khonshu, uh, but I believe that one maybe could be Taret, right? So is Khonshu here too? Is he in this mental institution? So I'm, that's fascinating. Huge cliffhanger, great double scream at the end. Amazing teeth. It showcases Oscar Isaac's fantastic teeth, which look so great against his skin. I'm like, that's some, uh, you know, matinee idol looks there, Oscar Isaac. All right. So that's the biggest twist. The second biggest twist is the gore and production design. I mean, this episode really brought it. I loved pushing the edge of the en envelope for Disney Plus in the MCU. Makes up for the lack of blood for the whole rest of the season. There was a lot of blood here. Hopefully they don't edit it out in few, you know, once this, uh, this uh, series is wrapped as they did with Falcon and Winter Soldier. They edited out some of the uh, violence. But I think it really highlights the horrors of ancient Egypt mummification, which I think are mesmerizing. And one of the things that makes so many kids have their ancient Egyptian phase. Like it really sticks with you. But there's also a lot of wonder, of course, to ancient Egypt. And I loved the practical sets. Uh, really wonderful for them to be able to play with this. Stephen's like a kid in a candy shop, and he really proved himself here. He's able to solve the maze and where Ahmet's statue is hidden in Alexander the Great's tomb. 
So I thought that was all great. A little bit more in Alexander at the end, but I loved that. I thought it was excellent. And it was very scary. I mean, they legitimately had some scary stuff here in the middle. That, uh, that uh, mummy uh, was like really terrifying. I thought they did, and I'm glad they went there. It was just great. And Layla versus the mummy, she got her Indiana Jones on. Mummies, why did it have to be mummies? Uh, Disney technically owns uh, Indiana Jones, so they could make that joke if they wanted to. Maybe in a season two. She should definitely get to do that. Uh, but it was a great scene. It was very scary. Uh, it was just excellent. I really, really liked it. Uh, but, you know, Layla screams after she defeats the mummy because she's having a real bad uh, week or a couple of days here. And of course, one, the next big twist is the reveal about what happened to her father. I love the exchange where Harrow is like, still hasn't told you, huh? And she's like, well, you're obviously dying too. I like that she didn't let him hold that over her. But it's a doozy. It's a doozy. Harrow, because he read uh, Mark slash Stephen, he knows that Mark Spector was there at the murder of Layla's father. That's the murder scene the police looked up when they captured uh, Stephen in episode two. They said, oh, look, you were, uh, you know, you're wanted in, in connection to the, this uh, homicide, this group homicide. Uh, Mark's partner, it turns out, killed Layla's father and then turned on Mark when Mark wasn't cool with it. And that's when Conchu resurrected him, again, with that string attached that now Mark had to be his avatar. And then it's also further revealed that the only reason that Mark even went to meet Layla is because he felt guilty and their whole relationship is built on a lie. Uh, that's pretty bad. That's a real gut punch. I mean, he might, does he truly love Layla? And how much is mixed into guilt for what he did to her father? Not telling her, I think, was a, obviously a big mistake. I mean, as upset as she might have been, since he's not the one who pulled the trigger, he should have been like, hey, man, I know who, I mean, I know who did. Let's go get him. Although uh, maybe Mark probably already got him. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's bad. It's a real, it's a real big problem. I don't know how they're going to get over that. But we've got a love triangle on our hands. That's the, th uh, that's the fourth big twist. And that's the kiss. I love Steven. As you know, he's my favorite of the two personalities right now. But my biggest issue is that Mark and Steven are watching each other when one is driving. And that is voyeuristic and creepy, particularly at moments like this. And again, Layla doesn't know. She doesn't know that her husband's watching her kiss this uh, other version of him. I mean, <clears throat> I think that would give her a lot of pause. Uh, she, she is definitely torn between Mark and Steven. I think she gets along better with Steven, but I think she might be more physically attracted to Mark, which is weird because it's the same body. I don't even know if it's appropriate for Steven to make a move on her because she's not totally broken up with Mark and he has an unfair advantage of being in the body of someone she already has a, you know, an emotional and physical relationship with. It's just very messy. But again, my biggest problem is that the other personalities are watching. And I think that underscores that they're separate individuals. And it's not really, t you can't really say, oh, well, it's kind of the same person. I'm like, no, the other person is watching in horror as you make out with someone else. Or, you know, who knows, down the line, go even further. So that's, I think, very unsettling and um, a real problem. All right, so what do you think of it? I know a lot of you swore they, a lot of, I kept telling you, I felt this was like, not, not, there are a lot of moral problems here. And a lot of you swore that Steven and Layla would never get together, but I couldn't say anything, even though I knew that that was the case. So I'm curious as to what your reaction is now that they have. All right, then finally, let's talk Kang. Now, when they first said this was the tomb of a pharaoh when they were in the maze, some of you during the watch along were like, ah, oh, Kang, Kang, but it wasn't Kang. It was Alexander the Great, avatar of Amet, apparently. Were his great victories due to Amet? Would Hera also conquer the world if he gained full power as uh, Amet's avatar? Did the gods take Alexander the Great down to take down Amet? Because of course they are the ones who hid this tomb in the first place and therefore also Alexander the Great. So I'm curious as to what the backstory is there. But even though it's not Kang, Kang was in ancient Egypt. where That's where he first time traveled to and lived as Pharaoh Ramatut, who crossed paths with N. Sabanur, a.k.a. Apocalypse, who again was ironically played by Oscar Isaac over in the Fox movies. But with Kang on the horizon, I mean, he's already here in the Loki show, as you know, but he's about to become an even, even bigger part of the MCU. And with his comics origin in ancient Egypt, that could be a good way to tie in Moon Knight. Maybe some of the gods remember Kang. They're like, oh yeah, that Kang guy. And again, you were just watching? Why don't you take a seat on the bench next to the Eternals, man? What the heck? 
But anyway, I think that's a good path forward for some cool storylines for Moon Knight in addition to the MCU horror section. I also want to touch on uh, Thor Love and Thunder. I want to bring up what a lot of people are saying because I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it. But of course, Gore, the God Butcher, is killing a bunch of gods in that movie. But what about all these gods that we're looking at here? Or what about the gods of Wakanda, like the Panther God? How do you not include that in that story? I think that would be very sloppy. Uh, I can, I can, but I don't know if they have space to do that. But it would be like a really big, like, what? Like, how could you leave that out? So I'm curious to see how they resolve that. All right, so what did you think of Moon Knight Episode 4 and all its twists? Uh, Now are you going to go read that comic, right, if you haven't already? Uh, I'll put a link down below to that graphic novel, which is available on uh, Comixology. Uh, And if you're a Comixology Unlimited member, I think it's probably still uh, included with your, your, your subscription. It was for me when I read it like a month or so ago, so I would imagine considering the popularity of the, well, you know, hopefully the popularity of the show, it would still be a part of that giveaway. All right, see you all next week as we all discover for the first time what happens next. Share your thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.